And I think that's where I get triggered a little bit because I do hear vulnerability and I hear, oh, just be softer. Right. How much more of myself can I possibly give? Yeah. And it feels very unprotected. Exactly. Yep. So yep. how do you protect yourself and be vulnerable then? As you step more and more into your power and yeah. you recognize the parts in your life where you're playing small and you, and you challenge yourself to bring your full authentic self to the table, you are inevitably going to make people uncomfortable around you. I'm not a natural winker. Well, this scenario is not natural either for it. <laughs> you, you can watch that back later and tell me what you think. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Let's talk about the children. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one thing that really made me want to, that's made me suggest this, um, you were talking about, what was it? We were talking about how you invalidate another person when you give in to, what was it? Like they're, it makes, if someone's looking at you and they think like, oh, that person is holding themselves too highly. What you're doing is you're giving into their, can you, mm -hmm. can you yeah, retract what that. you were saying? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was talking about how as you come more and more into your power, mm -hmm. you will inevitably start challenging people that are playing small in their own lives and they're like hiding behind something within themselves. Like as you step more and more into your power and you work on, you do your shadow work and yeah. you recognize the parts in your life where you're playing small and you, and you challenge yourself to, to not do that anymore and to bring your full authentic self to the table, you are inevitably going to make people uncomfortable around you. Yeah. Not because you are somehow better than them, but you are illuminating the ways in which they are hiding from themselves. Mm -hmm. So the, the goal is to like, to, for everyone to level each other up to our authentic selves, which is a, it's a mutual point of, of How do you enoughness. notice when people are act like feel threatened? Is it like a, der like a derision? Like, um, is it like, you said that you notice someone getting uncomfortable. Like, is it mm -hmm. almost like they think you're full of shit? Like what's the- Well, I notice it because as someone who's empathic, there have been so many times in my life where I would, just me being me, I would make people uncomfortable in some way. Yeah. And I, as a people pleaser for much of my life, I would tune into their discomfort, their like um, kind of being triggered. Yeah. And I would just intuitively adapt to make them feel better. Um, and often but like, what, what do you feel? feel what I from feel, them? what I feel in my body is that like, uh, I feel like a nervousness. Okay. So I, I, I will sense like a like a, a nervous energy. Yeah. And what I would do before is I would I would actually like almost make myself smaller. I could actually feel myself kind of like shrinking down okay. because it was a safety mechanism for me. Socially in the environment, it was safer for me to shrink down and respond to someone's nervousness or their ego being triggered in some way and to sort of fold into whatever they need me to be in order for them to be comfortable. Yeah. That, that would make me safe in the moment. When you say ego, it clicks for me. Yeah. Like, yeah. um, probably cause I'm not empathic, but when, like when I see people start to bristle, mm -hmm. that's when I start to be like, what did I do? Right. <laughs> right. Know? Yeah. And, but and you were saying you don't give into that. Right. Right. And so the, the ego is, I mean, ego is kind of a broad term and it can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, we can look at ego as being, if we think about ourselves as spiritual beings, mm -hmm. and ego is the personality self. It's the it's the vehicle essentially that we're driving through our lives. Yeah. Um, there can be times when our ego is like we've outgrown our ego. It's time for us to sort of transcend into a new self concept. Mm -hmm. And when we hang on to an old self concept out of fear or out of, um, it can sometimes sometimes just be like a a way to not deal with our own shame and pain because typically behind the underpinnings of an ego self-concept that the personality there's a lot of pain behind it and trauma oftentimes that like keeps us in this self-concept that we that we cling on to so dearly okay. and when we are challenged to have a broader perspective of ourselves it requires us to go 
and do a lot of inner work yeah. to get down to the linchpin that's holding that self-concept together. And is that what you refer to when you talk about shadow work? Like I've heard the words shadow work thrown around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, can you go into a little bit of that? Like what is shadow work? Yeah. What kind of shadow work have you done? Like yeah. what kind of work do you do? I mean, so shadow work would be all the different aspects of ourselves that we try to disassociate from that we don't think fits within our image of our ideal self, the, the self that we want to project out into the world. That's okay. kind of like our, if you think about like the, our, our daytime self versus our nighttime or our shadow self, the daytime self is like, I want to be, I want people to see me as intelligent, as, um, articulate as good looking, blah, 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 all these different characteristics. And I'm kind of like, I've, I have a self concept that is, is that I hang on to around that identity. Right. And if I come into any kind of circumstance that challenges that identity, um, there will typically be a tendency to want to hang on to it even tighter, to like grip even tighter. Okay. And it's because there's, there's this shadow part of ourselves that wants to be acknowledged, but we, it's so painful for us to actually go and look at it. Is that and, the piece that we take to therapy? Yeah. The shadow? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah okay. For sure. Yes. And that, that's the piece that when we, when we're in therapy, you know, um, uh, like a therapist or a counselor helps us look at these aspects of ourselves we might be running away from. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is that we are everything. We are, um, you know, we are like the full totality of yeah. the human spectrum. So we are intelligent and a bit stupid and we are beautiful and ugly. And because they're all just parts of the duality of the human existence right. and none of them are necessarily better or worse than, than the other. They're just parts of being human. It's when we hang on to one of those designators as being somehow more valuable than the other. And sometimes people will hang on to the negative characteristics as being more valuable for their self-concept because it keeps them safe as well. Right. You know, so like people that are strongly identified with an illness, for example, or, um, you know, like some kind of label that's been given to them early on in life, they might cling on to that because it makes them feel safer to hold on to the, even that negative um, characteristic than to let go and, and experience their full self. Okay, but why would they hang on to the negative characteristic? Like to... Well, I'll like, give you an example. Like okay. for myself, um, for myself, I've hung on to this idea of being too sensitive for so much of my life. Okay. And it, it's a safety mechanism to hang on to this kind of victimhood identity that I don't fit, I don't belong in the world, I'm too sensitive to do X, Y, and Z. And it, it kind of lets me off the hook from having to really be here mm -hmm. and really take ownership for my own existence and to recognize the ways in which I'm running away from myself. So it's easier to kind of run around being like, I'm too sensitive for this or this or this. So it's a protection. It can be a protection thing. mechanism. Exactly. Yep. It can be a protection or defense mechanism. Okay. Yeah. So like you would sit there and say, well, I can't do that. Therefore, I'm not going to risk it. And mm -hmm. therefore, I'm going to essentially limit yourself, but also kind of like create this hard shell. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so we can do that with, with seemingly positive traits. You know, I'm talking about like kind of more broadly accepted positive traits or broad, broadly accepted negative traits. We can do those with any kind of trait and and kind of like hang on to them as part of our self-concept, which becomes this false sense of self that we carry into the world, which protects us from actually having to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And vulnerable, I, you know, I've always been, <laughs> I think the, the idea of vulnerability has been like a confusing uh, concept for me for much of my life because yeah. as someone who traditionally has been a people pleaser and a bit codependent in past relationships. I always thought of the term vulnerability meaning like if I open up more, if I, if I'm more emotionally available, for example, 
then that's vulnerability. But there's a whole other part of it, which is that like, I see vulnerability as being like ultimate truthfulness. That's how I see it now. So, so like authenticity, right? Yeah. It's like, it's vulnerability is like radical authenticity where if I'm really honest with myself, maybe I don't actually want to share more of my emotions because I don't actually feel safe in this relationship or I don't actually feel like my needs are being met. Right. Just saying that my needs aren't being met in a relationship. That's actually a very vulnerable thing to do. Right. Um, and I think sometimes we can, I know I have in the past, I've like spiritually bypassed myself by, um, sharing something under the guise of vulnerability while being split off from my ultimate truth, which was that like, sometimes it's necessary to protect oneself. So I kind of struggle, I think, with the concept of vulnerability. I was listening to someone talk on the way here actually about, um, I think the whole premise was around how it's okay to be high maintenance, um, as long as you're maintaining yourself. Um, but you can also expect other people to meet you where you're, where you're level setting. And it's okay to expect that. It's not like this superficial thing that everybody makes it out to be. It's also like an emotional depth and intelligence thing and understanding that you need more than base level. And she was talking about it in terms of vulnerability as well. And I think that's where I get triggered, like triggered a little bit because I do hear vulnerability and I hear, oh, just be softer. Right. Oh, just be, be a nice girl. Be nice and be sweet. Yeah. So I've, it's funny because I've always thought of vulnerability as being just that too. I've always thought of it as being like, I'm going to just be, you know, like almost just like how, how can I, how much more of myself can I possibly give? Yeah. And it feels very unprotected. Exactly. So how do you protect yourself and be vulnerable then? Well, I think that real vulnerability is sharing what's actually going on within yourself. Okay. Real vulnerability is being willing to risk losing a relationship in order to stand up for who you truly are. So, but don't people not do that because they're the fear of rejection? Exactly. Right. Okay. But that, that's the thing. Like that's actually the fear of rejection, the fear of, of, um, abandonment. That's actually the, that's actually real vulnerability right there. Yeah. And if we ignore that, if we ignore that, truth of vulnerability in that moment and we just kind of go into this to this like colloquially accepted yeah. idea of vul- meaning like i'm just going to share 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 it's actually dishonest yeah because what's happening in the moment is like i'm afraid my, my true vulnerability is i'm afraid of you rejecting me yeah but i'm going to put on this facade so that you can to be give, anything to, to be whatever you need maybe by oversharing for example to hook you in that's manipulation yeah it mm-hmm. reminds me of just like being like raw chicken on the floor and just being pounded on like this yeah which is a really gross image but i don't know why it comes <laughs> mm-hmm. it just yeah but it so when you say manipulation though do you mean not like intentional manipulation no but i think like for those of us that are highly sensitive that may have more like anxious attachment styles or um codependent patterns mm-hmm. in our lives there is a component of manipulation that happens whether we want to (laughs) like whether we acknowledge it or not it's happening because we're basically trying to modify how the other person sees us Mm -hmm. in order for us to maintain the stability of their relationship where we're getting something yeah which is a feeling of, of validation or security and in exchange we contort ourselves a little bit. Because you're not being true. Right, right, yeah. And that's taken me a long, long, long time to learn. Yeah. I think I'm used to throwing the word manipulation around as like a really abusive concept. Mm -hmm. Um, It's almost like the word gaslighting has been overused. So like I end up, I guess it just like it's really... But the reason it's a heavy word, but the reason I like sometimes like when I work with clients or when I think about my own processes, I think it's really good to use heavy words like that because we can delude ourselves into thinking that we're being helpful, that we're being 
altruistic, that we're being um, only compassionate, we can use those labels and think of ourselves as I'm just this light in the world, for example. Yeah. When inside we're suffering because we're giving too much, our bodies are, you know, showing us signs that we are becoming resentful, for example, in relationships. Yeah. That means that there's something happening inside of me that is at odds with what I'm doing. Yeah. That means there's something out of integrity within myself. It means that I'm not being fully honest, probably not within myself first, but it's spilling out onto my other relationships. And so that's where there is manipulation happening. I'm not conscious of it. Right. Because I don't want to be a manipulator. Right. But it's like the white lie kind of thing. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's happening in, inside of me. Um, and, you know, I use that inner orchestra model a lot. Basically, what's happening is that in that moment, there's a section of the orchestra, a wounded part of myself, for example, from childhood, that's terrified of being abandoned, of, of being um, left behind, rejected. And that part starts running the show. Right. Rather than me as the conductor standing there and saying like, oh, there's a wounded part of me that's here that's that's trying to get a need met and is, is basically you're like usurping the rest of the players to right. do that. And and if, if that happens, then then I become split essentially. I'm not like acknowledging what all of myself wants in that moment. I'm just gonna be reacting yeah. probably unconsciously. How do you tap into your conductor? Because that's like the you're in your metaphor, right? The conductor is the main it's essentially your consciousness, right? That's responsible for keeping everything in a harmony. Yeah, your your conductor is like your super consciousness. It's your your higher um it's like the the wisest part of yourself mm -hmm. that is able to hold compassion for all of you. It's the part of you that is able to step back and doesn't need to like take action immediately because it knows that in the present moment, all needs are being met. Do you tap into that like by meditation or like, how do you, cause like for me, I can tap into that part of myself just by having downtime and like, mm -hmm. it's like meditation, but I wash the dishes for an extended period, maybe not an extended period. It feels like forever, but wash the dishes, you're doing something with your body. It's the same kind of meditative thing, but do you like actually meditate or how do you? Yeah. I mean, I have, I have like a, a morning routine that I do where I typically meditate for 30 minutes. Okay. It's just how I set my baseline for the day. And I like having some kind of routine like that because it gets me back to my center. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you do? So like you were talking about how you have clients, but you do, I don't know that you've oh, ever yeah. introduced sure, sure, sure. the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. To your work. Yeah. So I work with people in a couple different ways. Um, I work as a healer and a coach for people that are highly sensitive empaths. And I'll work with people one-on-one -on -one to help them navigate the unique challenges of being a highly sensitive person. Okay. And in that work, um, it oftentimes looks a lot like talk therapy where we just have a conversation and intuitively see where things lead. Yep. And then in those sessions, um, I'll typically also do something called caritas technique, which yep. is a form of energy healing work that is pretty closely aligned to some of the more popular somatic experiencing and somatic healing work that a lot of people are doing these days. But um, it's not just me directing someone into that somatic experience of healing, but actually holding an energetic container with them to facilitate a healing process. And so essentially what, what happens when someone comes into a session for, for that kind of a healing work, um, there's usually some kind of a breakdown or friction that's happening in the self-concept the, the ego identity that's causing some issues within themselves or in their life. Yeah. And basically what I'm doing in those sessions is I'm standing on my conductor podium, witnessing my personality self, and I'm just letting go of the need to 
um, be attached to like how anything works. Just moving into a state of complete receptivity. Yeah. And holding a container with another person while they do the same thing. So I'm guiding them through this process of noticing um, where this challenge that they're talking about in their life is showing up in their body. Okay. And holding space to watch as it transforms. So it's all this somatic work of um, noticing where some kind of an issue that's showing up in our life. Let's say it's like an interpersonal problem or something with work. Um, usually it feels like it's stuck in a loop. That's why they're seeking help because they can't figure it out on their own. And so what we do is look at all the ways that they might be trying to run away from a feeling that's emerging within themselves. Yeah. And we just sit in the feeling and we watch what comes up. We watch imagery, messages, um, intuition that comes forth for the person yeah. and helps them move through some kind of a process around it. And the goal or the outcome of that is that by the end of the session, there's a feeling of integration, of relaxation in the body. Yeah. The parts that felt stuck suddenly are moving and interconnected to the other parts of oneself. There's just like a, a flowing of energy that, that goes through the body. And you yeah. had a mentor that taught you this, yes? Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, so like how, how long did you study with him or practice with him or how yeah. does that work? So I met him in 2010. And so it's been about 14 years now that I've been working with him yep. first as a client. And then what happened is I was just doing the work so much with him as a client that I started to realize that I was able to do it with myself and also with other people. Yeah. I would, I'd have these spontaneous things happen where I was traveling or with friends where they would share something and I'd say, hey, let's try this thing where you do this, you know, just yeah. sit with the feeling and I'm going to go into a certain state and then let's just see what happens. And it was like, oh, this, it works. So then I um, started to, to work with my mentor in a bit more of like a kind of a true mentorship fashion where he started to give me guidance and helped me when I would run into issues working with people and um, because ultimately the test of being able to hold space like that is of my own integrity. Yeah. And if I ever leave a session, for example, with someone feeling like I'm taking on their stuff, like I feel tension or I feel um, like I, I'm drained at the end of the session, typically it means that I'm, I've become too attached to a false identification and I've kind of need to do a little bit of an adjustment within myself. Say more. So, because true healing is like a presence that passes through someone that is beyond the personality self. True healing is opening up as a conduit for that divine higher self to flow in to facilitate the healing process. And if I become too identified with Michael being the one who's doing the work, yeah. If I become too identified with the outcomes, then I kind of like close that channel off and I start experiencing a lot of issues in my own body and my psyche. And it's a really good metaphor and model for how just to be in the world, okay. which is that basically when I'm doing these one-on-one -on -one sessions with clients, my goal is to stand in the presence of who I am, mm -hmm. acknowledging where they are, and to not try to change or fix them. So so they're fixing them, so your goal is just to hold the space? Exactly. The okay. healing happens through resonance. And the resonance happens by me opening up to who I truly am, which is just What does the word resonance mean in this <laughs> capacity? <laughs> My, my understanding is that I, you know, when I do a healing session with someone, yeah. I'm committing to hold a certain frequency within myself. Okay. And basically I go into every session with the prayer and intention to allow my energy to adjust in whatever way can best serve the other person. Okay. And so... So your energy resonates with them? To yeah. Heal. Okay. Yep. Basically, okay. So I, I'm not going in and like changing the other person. I'm not, not going in and trying to like fix anything. I'm basically just holding my energy structure in a certain way that allows them to 
just like tuning forks, you know, it allows them to adjust and receive whatever they need to facilitate their own healing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really lovely way to put it. I mean, you go into doctors or therapists and you're just like, hello, please fix me. Right. And you expect other people to do the work almost. Mm -hmm. Although I don't think the doctors or therapists maybe expect <laughs> to do the work. Maybe they also want me to do the internal work. I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> but <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, when I started working with my mentor, Jake, I kind of got a little pissed off at first because I really wanted someone to like fix me. I wanted someone to give me the answers. I wanted yeah. someone to like, <laughs> I, I felt lost at the time. I wanted someone to just give me like the map. Yeah. And he would just always say like, oh, if you figure it out, let me know. Or, you know, like, I'd be like, God damn it. Like, yeah, but, I'd walk away being like, I'm going to hit you. <laughs> hit you so but hard. it really served me well because that's what, that's what like, that's what is, that's what an authentic teacher is. That's yeah. what, you know, modeling a sort of way of being with someone where you really trust that they have the answers and you trust that when it's appropriate to provide some guidance that you can trust that in the moment, but by and large, the most appropriate thing to do most of the time <laughs> is to just hold space for someone yeah. So that they can have their own experience of who they are and find the shifts within themselves. So many of the ways in which we suffer are because we don't trust our own process. Right. And we live in a society that is constantly trying to tell us to not trust ourselves and to look outside for validation, for security, mm -hmm. for the answers. And a lot of us are surrounded by kind of shallow relationships where people aren't willing to actually hold space for who we are. They will hold space for the parts of us that they feel comfortable with. But as soon as we are sharing like who we actually are, yeah. they get kind of triggered and, and uh, don't know what to do. Yeah. And when you're in the presence of someone that has the maturity to actually let you be who you are fully, everything that's going on in your psyche, your emotional body, your somatic realm, and they just allow you to be as you are. That's such a powerful experience. Yeah. I think so many of us are, are you know, along for that. And I remember when I when I met my mentor in my 20s and I had that experience, it was really profound for me because I didn't realize how badly I needed a container to just be. Yeah. Like it's so simple, but it's yeah. so rare. Yeah, I think a lot of people go without feeling accepted fully. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right um, that a lot of relationships people bend in. Um, I hadn't thought about it as manipulation before, but it's really truly like just the human need for acceptance and people bend backwards for it instead of just finding, it's almost like you find your soul tribe kind of thing. Where yeah. You find where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you just kind of land and you're like, Wherever I am, someone will accept me because I will be who they need me to be. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But I think it's an ongoing journey. I mean, I have found for myself that, you know, if you grow up feeling like you don't belong and you find a group of people that you feel like you belong in, you also have to recognize that, like, everyone's in an ongoing state of growth and progress. Yeah. And so you might meet a group of people when you're at a certain stage of self-awareness and growth. But as you continue growing, that matching might not be compatible anymore. Yeah. What have the biggest changes been for you as you've, like, because you're saying it comes in stages, like what have those stages been for you? What have those been like? I mean, I think that for me, the biggest stages of growth have happened after the loss of significant relationships whether that's of a romantic relationship, a friendship, um, a business relationship or engagement. It's oftentimes in the period of that, the loss of that relationship and sometimes right before it, that there's an experience of recognizing that I have not been my most authentic self. And I say that with a non-judgmental lens because I think that 
we're constantly growing and evolving and I'll be more authentic in an hour from now than I am right now because right. I'm continually committed to that process and I'll just be aware that I might have been hiding from myself in certain ways. Okay. But it's those major turning points in life where I might have like found some kind of security in a certain role and then recognized that my attachment to that role was incompatible with my authenticity. There's like a, a you know, like I've attached into this role and I'm going on this stage of growth and all of a sudden in order to keep growing, I either have to reconcile in that relationship and bring vulnerability to say, I am realizing that there's a part of myself that I haven't been totally truthful about. Yeah. And these are some needs that I have. And um, these are some things that are coming up for me. And being able to really stay true to that and be willing for the relationship to change or to to fall right. off, That's those have been like the, the biggest moments for me. And particularly because I think that as someone who's highly sensitive, I it's taken me a long time to fully trust my own experience, yeah. trust my sensitivity and um, to not feel like there's something wrong with me mm -hmm. and to not adapt, to not adopt like someone else's perspective or perception of who they think that I, I am. Yeah. So do you think, I mean, after you lose somebody, right, you whether it be a friend or a relationship, I mean, you will go through the stages of grief, right? Yeah. And so first there's denial, this isn't happening, or I guess I don't know the stages in order, but I'm thinking of one in particular, rage, right? Yeah, they don't have to go in order. That's, I mean, yeah. I think that's the really interesting thing about grief of any kind. And, and whenever we have some kind of a loss of anything, we go through grief, so. Yeah, but you get angry, right? Yeah. Oh, and yeah. so like, how long does it take from from getting angry to like finding your higher mountain man mm -hmm. Hindu yeah. you know like the the calm <laughs> I think yeah. that it's I mean Buddhist there's maybe. a really great book that I read at the end of my last relationship um, called The Journey from Abandonment to Healing mm -hmm. and the author Susan Anderson I believe she talks about the process of grief in particular to losing a relationship as going through the stages of shattering, withdrawal, um, internalization, mm -hmm. rage, and then levity. So the shattering is kind of like the just shock of the change happening in your life. I cannot believe that this just happened and just not like not being able to accept it. The withdrawal is like the physiological withdrawal yeah. we go through of, of the loss of that relationship. The internalization piece is we make it about ourselves. Yeah. We make it mean something about me. I did I'm I'm bad. I did this wrong. We like perseverate over our own role in that. Well, isn't that a little bit of what you're doing when you're saying that it's your fault because you weren't being authentic to yourself? Yes, but there's a difference between taking responsibility, accountability versus making it mean something about you as a as a person. So, I think that is an important part that happens in that stage of internalization is that you you do take accountability for where you may have not been fully authentic or maybe because it, the truth is in any relationship as an adult for most of the time you know no one's like handcuffing us in the relationship we're choosing to show up in that way and so um there there has to be responsibility that we take for our role in the relationship in order for yeah. our own healing process to continue but um in particular with that stage, if we think about it in that way, with the internalization piece, there's there's a taking responsibility, but most likely the reason that we didn't take responsibility in the first place is because we were attached to shame in some way. Mm -hmm. um, that I'm unworthy, that I um, am a broken person. These ideas of of some kind of like shameful why someone would love identity. me kind of thing exactly that's the internalization piece so it's it's sorting out it's sorting out the accountability versus the shame around it and then it the interesting thing is the next part is that it goes into rage okay so, so wait but hold on yep. so it's not i am 
bad because right. I wasn't authentic. Right. It's just acknowledging I was not authentic. This is how I sh- I want to show up next time type of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Because it's, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the shame that prevents us from being authentic. Yeah. It's the shame that causes us to splinter off and to separate. The shame is what keeps us in these different like hidden compartments. Mm-hmm. And when we recognize that the shame is a lie, ultimately, like the shame, shame in whatever form is a lie that gets passed on to people. That's how we're raised. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it gets passed on through generations. It gets passed yeah. on, you know, in different kinds of relationships or reinforced in different kinds of relationships. And when we actually shine the light on shame and we see, you know, like shame kind of muddles everything together. So it's difficult because in order to look at the cluster, which might be also mixed in with some areas of personal responsibility that we need to take. Yeah. You have to separate out the personal responsibility from the shame. Yeah. If they're together, you won't deal with it. You'll just kind of like, you'll keep trying to yeah, distract yourself. Path. From right, yeah. right. But, and you have to, re- that's, that's where the somatic work is really helpful because you have to recognize like, as I go to look at this thing, this pit in my stomach, I'm going to be confronting some of these areas of taking responsibility. And it's important not to lump them together with the shame. You right. have to be able to kind of like, sep- this is the good use of separation to, to sort of like sift off what's useful information and what is pulling me into the shame and if you can lift out the useful information that moves you into a state of empowerment and typically what i found is that it's in that state of empowerment that you now get access to more of your energy yeah this raw energy and this raw energy oftentimes comes up as rage yeah because it's 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 as if we've like locked a part of ourselves behind a door and the key to that door is the shame. And so if we, if we kind of deal with the key situation and we unlock it and we start to break that shame apart, then all of a sudden, all of this energy that has been sequestered away behind the door, the, what I like to call sometimes like our inner protector will come out because it hasn't been able to exert its power. It hasn't been able to set boundaries and speak its truth. Yeah. And it will come forth as like intense rage sometimes, like really intense rage. Oh yeah, I've rage. had that, yeah. Yeah, and it will be- The how through, dare you. Right, and yeah. it will be through the lens of the version of ourselves that got locked in there in the first place. So it comes through with this like intensely adolescent or childlike demeanor sometimes because- really? Mine comes through as like a, an older version. Mm. Like sometimes mine will come through as like, how who does that to a child? Like, how yeah. dare you? And yep. like, it comes through as like me now being like, wishing I could go back to like the younger years and be like, I'm going to kick your ass because she can't kind of I thing. think that's the healthy express. Like to me, I think that's, that is like your healthy inner defender coming out. Okay. Like I would say that when I get access to my rage in that way, when I go through a healing process, yeah, I kind of have both simultaneously. So I might have like, I'll have kind of the older, wiser inner protector come forward. Yeah. That's that's sort of like the the healthy use of anger, for example. That yeah. part of myself can be online, but simultaneously I might have like all of these younger parts of myself that felt disempowered, that felt like my wiser inner defender wasn't there to protect them. Yeah. And they sometimes have something to say about the like situation. Like to you? Like you're angry at yourself? No. Well, sometimes. Sometimes there is anger at self for not protecting my own needs yeah. or boundaries. Sometimes it's like outward at the person that I've had that too, where it's like, yeah. it's, it's almost like this like buzzing rage and then right. you're not sure what it is. And then after like, I'll take some time and sit there and think about it. And I'm like, Oh no, fuck you. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and then I'm able to channel it in a healthier way. Right. But it's, yeah. it's really important to get access to. I think, I mean, so many of us have been taught that anger is bad, that this yeah. intention, this intensity of like hot energy inside ourselves is bad and we push it down and it creates, for me, that's what I think is a huge, um, like contributor to depression. Yeah. It's just, we just kind of, we push, push, push our energy down and it creates such a limited experience of ourselves and our lives that feels just not worth it sometimes. Yeah. And when we get access to that power, that's why I like to just think about it like energy because 
it's like we're getting, we're turning on the fire hose of a part of ourselves that has been turned off yeah. entirely. Okay. And it's a part of ourselves that if it were able to stand up in moments of truth, would set healthy boundaries, would speak honestly. But because we've turned it off due to our own conditioning, our fear of um, disapproval, rejection, it just kind of gets blocked. So in the process of reopening that fire hose, that, that outlet of energy, the the walls of like the accumulated yeah. uh, like rust and sediment that's been building up spills forth first as this like intensity of rage and it's important to not take it literally because we might have images and visions that come through it that are like that seem very literal of like actions we want to take but if we just have a healthy outlet for it like a, a good mentor counselor therapist or journaling or something like that you can allow the energy to move forward so that then you now have access to use that energy in a really wise and healthy way. Okay. So the other thing, you're doing quite a few things at this point um, with your time. And it feels like every time I talk to you, you're adding one or 10 more, something like that. <laughs> well, it's, just, it's for me, kind of like what I was talking about before, I'm going through this process of, of uh, integration so I, I i had been split off in a lot of ways and now i'm bringing all these parts of myself back together and online at yeah. the same time yeah so yeah. you're doing the individual coaching yes you're doing group coaching yeah so a lot of my work right now is toward this community that i formed called kindreds note the shirt the shirt yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you make that yourself <laughs> yeah, good with the help of a friend shout out to andy fry yeah um but it's a community supporting highly sensitive entrepreneurs and creators. Okay. So the progression for me has been building my practice as a healer and a coach one-on-one -on -one with people. Once you were a entrepreneur, got it. Keep well, going. Yeah. So yes. the healing stuff. And then now I'm, I'm bridging in my back, my background in entrepreneurship and my desire to support a larger community of people. And so I've created this boot camp for highly sensitive people. That's, that, that's what highly sensitive people need. They need the a military. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the naming behind it is kind of intentional because I think that some of the ways in which us highly sensitive people suffer is that we don't develop a healthy masculine energy to support our sensitivity, our feminine receptive qualities. Right. And if we are relying upon the masculine structures of the world to see us, to validate us, it won't because the world's just not there yet. Right. And so it means that you have to create within yourself an internal environment that has the structure, that has um, the kind of forward moving, outward moving energy to make your life work while serving your needs as a highly sensitive person. So what does the boot camp look like? Yeah, it's a five day program. And it goes from day one around purpose and why. Day one is more so tapped into the deeper kind of intuitive work around who you are and what you want to bring to the world. And then we go into identity work around what self-concept like we've talked about earlier. You can get, have these self-concepts or personalities that limit your full expression of self. Mm -hmm. And in entrepreneurship, that can be really problematic if you're creating a vision for something and your self-concept is incompatible or limiting um, you to be able to step into that vision. So okay. we do identity work. We go into, I introduce a framework called EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System, that I've used in the past for other businesses, but I'm kind of uh, crafting or um, guiding people to use that framework from their intuitive self so that it's not just like up here. Meaning as they're going through the exercises of um, identifying their 10 year target, three year target, one year plan for their business, it's not just coming out of like their intellect and their, yeah. and their egoic um, idea of, of success. It's coming in for like a, a deeper heart space connection. So there's a visioning exercise that I teach that was um, given to me by, by one of my mentors, um, Stanley Fisher. And it's a, an exercise to tap into your heart and your innocence to answer questions around what vision you want to bring forward in your life. And okay. so I'm combining some tools with some more tried and true 
business frameworks to give highly sensitive people kind of the best of both worlds. Let's say someone came to you and they said, I want to own a gas station. Yeah. It's my dream. Yeah. Um, how would you coach them to incorporate their empathetic energy there? Like, The thing is, there's, there's no um, right or wrong container for entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And if someone has a vision around something, we're going to trust that that's what they're meant to do. It, it might, might transform over time. But, but I mean, with the innocence and the part that yeah. excites it, like how do you, like what does would, that process look like? Yeah. It would look like, I mean, that's the day one work is identifying what their mission is around, like, what do they want to bring to the world? What kind of legacy do they want to leave? If they didn't have to worry about money, what would they be spending their time doing? So let's say this person who wants to um, open a gas station, uh, let's just hypothesize that for them, if they were able to just hang out with their friends or, or hang out with people and understand their lives, that brought them a lot of joy then we would tap into that as being their purpose, like creating authentic connection, for example. Okay. And in this case, let's say it, it comes in the form of starting creating this neighborhood gas station where they're able okay. to be like this center point for community. And I'm just kind of riffing here, but that's yeah. the idea is to like take whatever the external structure that they're thinking about and tap into what's their why. I mean, Simon Sinek has a really great um, TED talk and a book called Start With Why, and it's all about understanding, before you get into the how and the what, tapping into the why of why do you exist, what is it that you're here to do, and making sure that your, um, that your business is in full alignment with that. I like that. I mean, the reason that I took a step back from my last entrepreneurial venture, which was around the time that my last relationship ended, it was a major upheaval in my life that happened around the time of COVID, where I recognized that I wasn't fully living my why and my purpose. I was running a web development company and um, I was quite stressed and burnt out by the end of it. I didn't feel like I was living my purpose. I didn't feel like I was showing up every day as the version of myself that I wanted to be. And so mm -hmm. I started doing this work of untapping my why. And as I started doing that, I recognized like, I wanna be having I want to help people heal. I want people. I want to help people grow. I want to have these kinds of conversations. This is how I want to spend my life. Yeah. And it felt so incongruent with what I was building at the time. And so I closed the business down. And I've spent the past over two years now building my life around being a healer and a coach and supporting people that really want to be tapped into their heart space as well. And consequently, now I've reopened my web development company and it has a different angle. So the, the how and the what is somewhat similar to what it was before, but the why is completely shifted and anchored now so that as I'm taking actions and um, you know building a team and building structure around it, it, uh, it all comes down, it comes back to my center mission, which makes it all sustainable. And the center mission for you is? My center mission is to help people reconnect to their true nature Okay. Whatever that means for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. gas station person yeah. really just wants to do big oil. Yeah. What if that's their driving force? Are you behind that? It's not really up for me to, to decide. <laughs> I, mean, I just had to ask. Yeah, I don't love it. But like, here's the thing about, you know, being a guide or a teacher or a healer. When I step into a session with someone, I have to trust that their heart is showing them something Mm -hmm. Even if I don't get it. Yeah. That's, and that is stepping into that channel energy. Yeah. So my personality self might be like, what the hell are you doing? Like I, yeah. I might have, I might have a session with a client, for example. Pause. This is a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. I, like <laughs> I, and I do have that happen. I mean, I, I'm very much human. And so when I go into sessions with clients, what I'm doing is I'm watching where my personality self is getting in the way of being authentically connected to someone. Right. So let's say someone is sharing with me their, their dream and their story. I have to very carefully watch when I'm getting an intuitive hit around something that might be wanting to share something. It comes through a very different feeling. If there's like a sense of peace behind it, it can be strong, but there's a sense of peace behind it versus if I'm having like a judgment around what they're saying and my response to that comes from a place of judgment, 
it's a very different energy. And mm. I have to be mindful of how I'm responding in the moment because one of those avenues reinforces a kind of power dynamic. Yeah. It reinforces an inauthentic self-concept. And the other one uh, is kind of impersonal and non-attached. Right. Yeah. It's good there's people like you in the world. My first thought would be, all right, well, we're locking you in a basement, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, back to the coaching sessions you do for the groups, though. Yeah. So you do one day of um, what's their purpose, and then you guys, so I think we were on day two or day yeah, three. Yeah, so, oh, so day three is about vision. Day four is value proposition design. So How I really to turn what they are into money. Yeah, and, and not just that, but like getting really clear about who are you here to serve and how are you going to serve them? Okay. I And this is the whole thing about, you know, working in the realm of spirituality and kind of a little bit more esoteric kind of stuff, which is, you know, the highly sensitive people are very much in that, that more kind of holistic world. Um, I think oftentimes we can kind of spiritually ghost ourselves by just thinking if we're just in this kind of realm of, of um, thinking positive thoughts or um, just being in this kind of vibe that somehow we're going to make results. Yeah. And you have to be able to couple that with real practical steps. We and also have to live and make money. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And you can't, the thing is like, if your goal is to bring more peace and love to the world, but you're constantly worried about money because you're not taking the concrete steps to move your life forward, your business forward, then you're not actually doing that much good. You're kind of like stuck in neutral. Right. And so it's important to be able to bring these both together. And that's been honestly a, a, a challenge for me is to, to bring, to consolidate or to synthesize my entrepreneurial background and my spiritual healer self and yeah. be able to have them come together and not worry about one or the other compromising the integrity of those goals. And, but to get back to what I was saying about the value proposition design stuff, it's all about like taking this more intuitive feminine perspective. I call it feminine because it's that more of the yin yang. Uh, that's, that's the energy of it and coupling it with some like really practical, um, frameworks. So thinking about like, who is your ideal customer? Where did they grow up? What does their economic picture look like? What's their demographic? Um, where are they shopping? What problems are they trying to solve in their life? What challenges are they facing? And then specifically, how is what you are creating and offering going to fit for what they need? Yeah. And there's this whole process about creating a value proposition map where you are, are kind of testing out different criteria, testing out different customer sets, cu testing out different value proposition sets, different products and services you can offer in different configurations to make that match more ideal. Yeah. Um, so it's really about optimizing and getting real about what it is you're going to create and, uh, and iterating through the process to make it happen. Okay. And then day five is taking, you can probably tell the energy of it is getting more and more masculine. Yeah. Because by the end of the, of the week, we go into traction. So we go into basically all of the tools that we, we've, we've laid out over the course of the week, looking at from like a monthly or quarterly, monthly, um, weekly and daily segments, what systems can you have in place to help move the needle forward? So what tools can you have to organize and focus your vision um, so that you can make it happen? And it's like small groups that do this together? Yeah, so the boot camp is a smaller group, max yeah. 10 people. We also have an on-demand version where people can access it um, on demand. On, on demand. <laughs> <laughs> As one does. You know, imagine. <laughs> it's wild how words work like that. Um, but with the, in either case, you're part of a cohort of people that are there to support you. And then after the boot camp mm -hmm. ends, there's an opportunity to join our um, Kindreds Plus yeah. community. Yeah. <laughs> where we have weekly accountability pods and coaching that, that continues. So. Can you look in the camera and say Kindreds Plus and wink? Kindred's plus. <laughs> I'm not. A, am I a good week, weaker? Kindred's plus. Was it that? Was it this eye? Um, I wouldn't. Kindred's suggest, plus. Nope. 
No, I wouldn't okay. suggest either, actually. <laughs> I would. I'm, a, I'm not a natural winker. Well, this scenario is not natural either for it. <laughs> you, you can watch that back later and tell me what you think. <laughs> I'm not either. Like, yeah, it's okay. okay. My daughter's at the stage where she just goes, and I'm oh, like, oh, cute. I nailed it. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly sweet. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't look like you just tripped out. It's fine. But you, you can you can wink. I mean, I have. I can shut one eye. Okay. Oh, that's pretty weird. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you did. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you can do the individual coaching. You can do the career path thing, or the boot camp. Yeah. Um, talk to me about your the the uh, software development firm you just oh, restarted. Oh yeah. I mean, so I've been in web development since I was like ten or something. Since the internet came since out. Since the internet was made. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Al Gore and I, we sat down. We're like, let's make the internet. I don't think you understand how old we are compared to <laughs> other people now. But yes, <laughs> you think I'm joking. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to mew. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> uh, low key, though. Low key Sigma. Yeah. But yeah, so I've been in web development for a long, long time. Got into programming when I was... Um, in high school and have had a couple different web development companies. One was called Best Hive, the second one was called Kudos Code, and I have reopened Kudos Code recently, brought some of the same team members back, and we are creating websites and helping with marketing automation for uh, mission-driven small businesses and entrepreneurs. So it's pretty close in alignment with Kindreds and that community as well. Okay. But um, yeah, basically helping people build um, a strategy around what their website looks like and how it functions, and then um, understanding what tools they're using within their business and helping them automate things to make it all a lot more seamless. And how does that align differently for you this time? Because you said you closed it because it wasn't in alignment. Yeah, I mean, last time, I think a couple of different things. I've changed in that I'm a lot more honest about how I want all of my relationships to be. Yeah. So when something's not working, I just say it. <laughs> yeah. So even as I've been getting my team back up and running, I feel like I'm a lot more clear what my expectations are. And I'm less, uh, I have a less of a tendency of overextending myself to the point of incremental resentments that will build up over time. Yeah. That's one thing. The second thing is just the customers that we're working with Previously, I had a, a business model where we were working with creative agencies, mm -hmm. which were wonderful, but um, not exactly a place that gave us the opportunity to feel really fulfilled. I've and worked at an agency, <laughs> so I can say not the chillest it's, people. Yeah, not, yeah they're I mean, always under pressure. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not their fault either. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. It's just yeah. like, there's a lot of pressure and tension. And I think it, because I didn't oftentimes have the best boundaries, we get I would take a lot of that pressure on and I would, yeah. I would. Well, they just want it off of their plate. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm a open sponge. I'll take that on. And then I would, yeah. it would like build up inside of me and then get spread out to my team. And it just created an, an um, unsustainable environment for me yeah. personally. And this time I'm just much more clear on who we're working with. And the people we're working with now are people that are doing a lot of similar work. They're holistic um, practitioners or people that are have some kind of mission-based business and uh, it's really exciting to help them build their business and give them the tools to thrive. Do you make less money doing that though? When instead of working in like a corporate agency environment? I mean, it's, I think actually we have a little bit better margins because we're offering more value versus being just a small part of the value chain Yeah. as, as we were before. Okay. So I think we'll actually be more profitable this time around, but, um, yeah, we'll kind of just see how it goes. It's pretty new. That's between to, you and your yeah, accountant. Yeah, I'm yeah. mostly <laughs> just curious because it is yep. such a shift. And I think that's one of the fears. I mean, that's a big fear I have, right? Yeah, I mean, and this is something that I coach people on that are interested in entrepreneurship is that it doesn't have to be like a black and white scenario where you quit your job and then devote 100% of your time to this venture. It's smart to start building a bridge. Yeah. And sometimes if a person is like in a job situation that feels... Um, like soul sucking and training, just starting to take the steps to start following their passion can alleviate a lot of that tension. Yeah, It's about building a bridge to where they want to go. And that's why like the tools that I'm sharing within the bootcamp, for example, they are foundational tools that you can adapt 
incrementally over time. You don't have to start out with like all of them. You just start with a few pieces and, and make the vision, the dream, the mission more of a reality mm -hmm. than just this kind of ambiguous idea or goal. And as you start seeing more concrete progress, it could be the most simple things. It starts to materialize this bridge right? where eventually that feels as real or more real than where you were at before. And the income earning part of it is just going to be incremental as well, most likely. You'll go through a process of taking on lower paying clients as you're building your value proposition and getting feedback. And, and you just start climbing up that ladder until eventually you get to a point where your income is matched or above the, you know, the comfortable job that you were at before. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I think you don't want to start the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial journey with like a significant amount of pressure to make this work immediately because you're going to take actions that are out of integrity. Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna, if, you're, if your goal is to just like make a lot of money quick, it's pretty hard to stay heart centered and follow your. I've been truth. told that you can just manifest money, so oh, yeah, okay. I think you're wrong. But well, that's hey, fine. as my mentor, as my mentor would say, let me know how that works for you, and you just come back and <laughs> I'll report, bring all back. my pile of money and throw it at your <laughs> yeah, feet. Yeah. <laughs> <It's great. laughs> ha -ha. I'll, I'll take everything back. I said. <laughs> yeah. um, so, what kind of? Uh, how much do you charge clients for this kind of work? I mean, I charge one thirty-five an hour right now for one-on-one -on -one work. Okay. Our boot camp is valued at around like two thousand total with all the things that we give, um, but the price is just four ninety-seven right now. Okay. And that, whether it's the in-person boot camp or on demand, on demand we have a couple other perks we throw in there for people that aren't able to attend live. But uh, yeah, that's that's how the pricing works. And it's all under kindreds. Yeah, the the one-on-one -on -one coaching is technically under um, my brand, One Michael. And then okay. Kindreds is like a subsidiary of, of that brand. Kindreds is more so focusing on the group work and the and the community specifically. So we have this community now of over 140 people, highly sensitive people, a lot of them creators and entrepreneurs. And the goal is to keep building that up and providing different um, tools and courses to help people thrive and support each other. Okay. That's yeah. lovely. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you were at the state fair this year. Did you go to the state fair this year? I didn't go this year. Okay. I was just thinking about that. Have Are you, you gone? going? Oh, I try not to go around giant groups of people. It makes me want to That's pull what I was my talking hair out. about. I Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you had a very different experience. <laughs> I have this weird thing where sometimes when I'm in like large groups of people, I just can't help but think about like all of their bodily processes. Like I, I don't know if it's like an empath thing, but I just see like a sea of like when you say processes my brain goes to pooping <laughs> that's what i think about i think about like you are about to poop your pants i think so. about like how everyone is like processing food and having to like poop and pee and it's just like very intense for me sometimes i don't know there's a bit of an acclimation period whenever i go into large crowds where i have to like kind of sort it's more out. just like the sweat and like yeah the annoying like touching me and I'm like, oh my God, please stop. <laughs> like, it reminds me of like going yeah. to Disney World with my mom as a kid and I would always like, I remember being, it was like my mom's skin was like was cool. Oh, yeah. And I would like want to like touch, I would like grab her elbow and she'd be like. Oh my God. When I was little, I remember wanting to sit on my mom's lap and her being like, it's too hot. And me being like, it's always hot. It's fine. And yeah. now my daughter comes and she's like, I want to sit on your lap. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to be touched. It's so hot. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, I get that now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. There's just like so much going on all the time. I just can't handle the state fair with it. Like everybody loves the state fair here, and like I love the idea of it. I love the dairy barn part of it. Yeah, no, I think I it's love a, a great princess, concept. I love but... the idea of bringing people together. And sometimes I, I really can really I can have a great time. I enjoy people watching and have you know I like I have fun. I can have fun. I can do this. I can have fun. Yeah. But uh, there's a point where I just need some some time and space. I have a lot of alone time in my life. So. <laughs> <laughs> Would you, okay, you said that you wouldn't consider yourself an empath, but you sound like. Um, I don't know. Um, so one of the things I've always felt like I can understand what people are thinking when mm -hmm. like, but that is also a trait of having a very traumatic childhood Yeah. because you right. learn that as a protection mechanism, like you well, try to anticipate. So I don't know. I mean, here's the thing. Most empaths are people that have experienced childhood trauma oh. that are hyper attentive 
because of that need to feel safe in their environment. I mean, that, yeah. that's like a major component. There's there's certainly like a, a biological component, I think, too, as well. But but childhood trauma is a, a part of it. And it could be like a, a big T trauma of like a significant thing or a significant uh, parental issue, or it could be like sort of over time, a certain pattern that yeah. forces a person into this sort of like open, like overly open state in order to, to feel safe. So two therapists ago, I didn't like her, so I fired her. Yeah. Um, and I say that with the utmost... Love. No. <laughs> There's a reason she's gone. She was our marriage counselor first, and it did not work out. I was just well, like... you're still married, so something, something worked. Yeah, the second therapist worked. <laughs> the first one, I was like, excuse me, you're taking his side for everything, and I don't appreciate this. Um, but she said that like you have like she basically said like well you have to ask because you can't just assume they're feeling this way and i was like but you can because that's how they're acting and yeah. you know this person you've known this person 14 years yeah and then i'd ask and I'd feel like you'd say different things just to be contrary but so i don't know where i sit with that i yeah. don't know if i can actually like tell what people it's it created a lot of dissonance because i've i've gone my whole life feeling like i understand how people are feeling and feeling like i know like i can make like, you know, like, it is manipulation, I guess, to feel like you can make more people more comfortable. It is, yeah. But then I sit there going... If it's for your benefit in some way. Yeah, so then I get more in my head now, I guess, because I'm just like, am I making that up? Is that an assumption? And then I ask people very directly, is this how you're feeling? And then I give myself little high fives when I'm like, yeah, yeah I nailed it. <laughs> well, sometimes, I mean, the way that I look at it is like, sometimes I'll be picking up on something that someone's just not aware of. So I can ask them a question, but they just might, like, I might be feeling, because it comes in a very visceral way for me. I, I'll feel like if I'm around someone that has a lot of anxiety, I'll yeah. start feeling this, like, this thing in my in my belly sometimes. Yeah. And I can typically, there's a almost like a distance of separation between, like, where I would normally have mine and where I can feel theirs. So I can typically tell where it's like not my stuff. Do you ever just go, are we anxious? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's okay. I mean, like I'm, you know, we all have stuff going on. And so um, it's an opportunity for me to just allow them to be where they're at and not need to change them. Yeah. But the reason I might be triggered is because. But what do you ask? Uh, I might not ask anything. Or if I do, um, you know, the thing is like, my mind can extrapolate out what I think the issue is, but I don't actually know in the mind level yeah. oftentimes. Yeah. I mean, there are moments when I'll get like an intuitive hit, but it's a different scenario. It's an invitation in those moments typically. If someone's inviting me to be with them and it feels like a, it's a reciprocal moment, then if something comes through, then it's helpful. If yeah. I'm like trying to go into someone's world in order to make me feel comfortable, then that's usually coming from my ego. And if so, then my interpretation is probably skewed. Yeah. And so I might be sensing someone's stuff, but it's not really up for me to change that or fix it. And um, and if a conversation opens up around it, then I also need to have this openness that I don't really know what's going on. Yeah. It's important to just the have... layers. Yeah, right. Maybe that's what the therapist was trying to say. Maybe mm -hmm. she was, shouldn't have been fired, but I don't know. <laughs> one, of, one of my therapist's counselors encouraged me to think about that sort of thing, like it's just information that I'm receiving in the moment. So yeah. in the moment, I'm 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 noticing anxiety. I'm noticing this sensation. Yeah. And if I make it all about them and their stuff and blah blah blah, then I'm kind of like losing the point in the moment because the point is that I am having this experience in which I'm feeling someone else's stuff. Right. And so I get to then decide in the moment. Oh, are my boundaries a little bit too open here in this moment? Is this a is it appropriate right now for me to be feeling? this person's stuff. Is it necessary? Yeah, because you and, almost try to contort yourself. Right, right. So it's in those moments that I then, I'm then doing some work with myself to notice, oh, the walls of my orchestra hall are a little bit too permeable right now. Okay. And would I like to close those down to feel more anchored? Is it possible that I could rest back in the presence of who I am, knowing that I am safe? But ultimately, I'm probably being a lot more helpful if I don't react because I'm modeling that in the present moment, there's safety. So when someone's experiencing anxiety, most of the time, it's um, it's like an irrational yeah. fear that something like I, that I'm not safe in the moment. Yeah. And just because it's irrational doesn't mean it's not valid. It probably it can be you know triggered from trauma, whatever. Yeah. Um, but if I'm able to hold a presence that doesn't start hitting the volleyball back and forth with them. Yeah. 
tennis. I was going to do tennis at first, and then I volleyball. <laughs> okay. I also use a racket for volleyball, volleyball, but I don't know how to play volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> but so if someone's if someone's like starting to throw a ball in their anxiety, for example, or whatever their state is, yeah. And then I and then it triggers me, like, oh, I gotta fix this person's stuff. Then we're just basically pop. But throwing this you're validating back. each other essentially right? yeah and not in a healthy way yeah whereas if i'm if i notice someone's anxiety is coming up and then i notice that's making me anxious in some way because i feel like i need to fix them in order to be okay then that's my problem that's my that's my stuff and so yeah. i then get to go oh michael you're safe you don't need to fix or change anyone in order to be safe in this moment i'm working on my trauma yeah and how it's impacted my present moment and i'm becoming a an example in that moment of safety for me and the other person too. Yeah, I was, um, it was something as simple as like, I took my kids to Costco and my kids were, we were eating hot dogs and my kids were running under tables. And you know how like growing up, it was a different world. And if you were to bother the people next to you, like you couldn't exist almost as a kid. Yeah. And so they would be, they were doing that. And I was sitting there and I was just breathing through it. My husband goes, why are you so anxious? I was like, I mean, could you see this being okay with my dad? And he goes, no. And I was like, yeah. So I'm breathing through it because it's going to be okay for them. And it's going to be okay <laughs> for me. And I am just, everything in me wants to protect them from what yeah. I see is going to happen. But nothing's going to happen because I'm the, so yes. That's so, but that's so amazing that you had the awareness in the moment. And it's amazing how much our past experiences come to sort of change our present. Yeah. Our present experience, to, you know, it's like we're, we're, we're not really looking through the eyes of our adult self. We're looking through the eyes of yeah. 10 year old me who's like scared about, about like getting its needs or his or her needs. Well, and when you talk about the somatic piece too, like for me, it, tur- it started by learning how my body reacts in certain situations. And then I almost have to work backwards from my body to my brain. Yeah. Like maybe a lot of people are stuck in their heads because it almost feels to me the way you're approaching it is from an intellectualization it's, or is well, it opposite? I mean, I do intellectualize a lot of it to kind of give a framework, but all of the work that I do one-on-one, not all, I get, a lot of it starts bottom up where we go into like where the somatic is showing up, where where, where the sensation is showing up at the bottom. But does it start with like a scenario? Like, like yeah. where you're like, hey, do you want to talk about X? And then- Yeah, it can be, but sometimes it can be just be like, I have this weird feeling in my my heart i feel like there's this like urgency i feel it could start there okay i mean honestly that's better yeah because it goes right to the core it's just most people don't come in fully aware of what they're feeling most people come in with like the problem and then we have to i i like i'll just kind of we'll talk through that just so i can understand the scaffolding of their mind there's a really good book that i love called the dark side of the light chasers by debbie ford okay and it's all about making peace with the parts of ourselves that we want to hide from the world and understanding how much energy we spend trying to hide those parts of ourselves. Yeah. And she has a lot of really great exercises where you get to just like recognize the value that those parts bring to your life. They might just be like turned up too high or too low. Yeah. And if you can find a way to have them have a seat at the table with the rest of your parts, then you'll be in a lot less inner conflict and you can show up as your whole self. I don't know if I've ever done the work as consciously as you have. Like I've fixed bits and pieces of myself over time because it was necessary, I guess. And like you have this full conscious, like this is how you become a better person and yourself and you have verbiage around it. Is it because you've done studies and you've worked with a person that uses that or like I mean, it's usually that my entry point is that I get some kind of a tool like yeah. that. And it's also that I, I'm so obsessed with this stuff that I think about it constantly. Yeah. So I'm constantly figuring out language to describe my internal process. Yeah. Because, um, like, you, it makes it sound very solid and less uh, woo-woo. Like, whenever mm. I describe to people, like, they're like, oh, what do you believe? And I'm like... I believe that you have karmic energies to work through and you must become your authentic self. Yeah. And uh, have you read this book, Journey of a Soul? And <laughs> I do too. I mean, yeah. I think I'm just in a stage of life where I'm a bit more concrete. Yeah. Like 10 years ago when I joined a spiritual community and left my job and moved to Utah. For you a mean a bit. cult? Well, That's a cult, what you just it described. I, I don't actually know the specifics <laughs> you're talking about, but what you just described was a It was a little a bit cult. culty, okay. <laughs> but I also had a really great experience there. So on the record, I don't want to call them a cult. But um, okay. I 
there's been a portion of my life where I think I was sort of up in this very esoteric world. Yeah. And like when I started doing energy healing work and I started my consciousness started to break open, I started to go through an awakening process. It was like I got to leave earth and it was really nice to leave earth because I was experiencing a lot of suffering. And so it was just great to kind of like, I got to like float above my existence in some way. And I was able to kind of just use like this flowery, ambiguous language. What were you like suspended in a tank? Like, how did you move? <laughs> I'm literally imagining no, I Avatar, mean, like, but like with your body. I started to like have this experience that who I truly am is not here in this physical reality. Yeah. And so, for example, I was studying A Course in Miracles, which I still think is a really great text. But it was all through this lens of I am not a body. This world is an illusion, which I still believe on some level. It's just that if you don't take that perspective and also integrate it with the fact that, well, it sure feels like we're here right now yeah. and I'm in this incarnation. And if I'm not actually honoring the reality of this experience and reality of my relationships, then I will have a tendency to spiritually bypass my existence. I'll have a right. tendency of not actually being honest in my relationships because it's all a dream. We're not actually separate. We're yeah. all just one. And so and who cares? There's less, of a, there's less of a need to be fully authentic with what I need in this relationship if I just can spiritually ghost into it doesn't it's not actually real it's not actually happening anyway we're just we're just beings of light which we are but if you don't have them well, if you don't if you're not like on the x and, and y axis simultaneously you'll either become overly identified with the body and yeah. your physical form or you'll become so identified with your spiritual form that it's like well then why are you here well it also <laughs> I feel like when you get overly identified with the, oh, this is just a reincarnation, it really downplays some of the suffering in the world, right? Yeah. Because you sit there and you're like, well, what did so-and-so do to deserve that? Right, Like, right. what did those, like, what did th those children sure, do? exactly. So... And they're, you know, who know like, I think it can introduce a level of spiritual narcissism. Yeah. Where you can kind of just like, like, oh, I actually remember <laughs> encountering people like this years ago where... I had this inclination to go help a homeless person, for example, and they would say something like, oh, they, they asked for this existence. You know, they, they, they don't need your help. They, they, they asked for this. And it's like... Hard pass. Well, <laughs> I'm also a human being. And if someone is asking for something and I have the ability to provide that, I'm going to do that. And, and I asked for my existence. So my existence Right, right. Is, it doesn't... Yeah. I think it's like, sure, that there might be some truth to that. I don't know. I'm not, I don't like, I don't have that level of certainty. And I'm grateful to not have to need to know that. Yeah. But... The point is, like, if it if hanging on to that vantage point, which I think there's a real value in being able to go through that spiritual growth where you can have that kind of higher level awareness. But if that process prevents you from being boots on the ground here in this world and it prevents you from being truly compassionate and connected to other people, yeah, then that doesn't actually solve anything. Yeah. <laughs> it actually is kind of antithetical to that aim. Yeah. That's, I think that's where I end up getting stuck because I sit there and it makes me really angry to think of the lack of compassion people have for other people. Yeah. Um, especially like with all these, like all the judgment out there in everything where I've had a really bad, um, I've just had bad feelings towards a lot of religious doctrines just yeah. because like you preach love, but what are you doing about it? Right. And so... Like, that's why I say, like, it, it sounds, it's good to hear you talk about, like, really concrete, using concrete words, I guess, because it makes it less about what you believe in what you, than what you do, right? Well, I think about, I mean, the way that I look at spiritual frameworks, religions of any kind, I see them personally like, uh, like software, like versions of software. The purpose of, of a religion or spiritual framework is to make a direct connection with the divine, whatever that might be. Yeah. I can't define exactly what that is, but I, I know what the feeling of that presence is in, yep. in myself. And so I see religions kind of being like languages and facilitating that process. Yeah. And we can experience something on our, on our journey of growth in that we can become incompatible with a version of that software. For example, like growing up gay, a certain version of, of that religious framework became incompatible for me. Mm -hmm. And I had to basically make a decision whether I was going to 
hamper my personal develop my personal and spiritual development to stay stuck in a framework that didn't really like see my future growth or trust in my own process which yeah. to me is authentic spirituality yeah. to me authentic spirituality is a lived internal experience and yes we can have frameworks and religions that can help us on that way yeah but if it's not a lived experience it doesn't really mean much yeah so yeah i like to honor people's religions and their frameworks in the way that i like to honor my own spiritual perspective as being exactly what it needs to be for someone and at the same time i think it is good to point out where a person's perspective or framework could be causing significant suffering for other people and yeah. it could be like could be causing tremendous suffering i think it's good to call it out and i also think it's good to understand that inside that person who's hanging on to that framework that might be causing suffering is someone who just desperately wants that connection with divine yeah and it's giving them that bigger than themselves it's it's solving that for them in that moment yeah and they don't have another option at the moment and so i try to have compassion for that as well i think that's fair um yeah because like not everyone is the worst of those groups right and there's a lot of people in different religions who are wonderful yeah i just yeah i tend to and I've, I've learned so much from different li religions you know so many of the teachings that have been passed on to me oh yeah and they're all from... basically like love your neighbor right right, right. at the, Which at, is the, at the foundation right. yeah mm -hmm. it's just yeah. it gets all it gets a little bit messy, lost in translation right. Which, but just like yeah. any group of people that come together for some kind of aim like we have a tendency as human beings to kind of mess things up when we get <laughs> power and control and, you bet. Yeah. <laughs> so it just it kind of is how it go how it is and we have to just decide what to do with that yeah yeah interesting it's yeah. hot and i have to go yeah thank you so much for thank you mike this is lovely this is really i great. would love to do this again yeah. okay me too yeah, yeah. thank you um, Pick a place with air conditioning, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>